Howard Kingsbury Smith has been an award-winning radio and television newsman for more than 35 years, covering a news beat extending from the cities of Europe, the Middle East, and Africa to the cloakrooms and corridors of the nation's capital. For many of those years, he was chief European correspondent for CBS News, having earlier covered pre-war Berlin and the world conflagration he predicted would result from German fascism. In 1957, CBS brought him to Washington, ultimately as chief of the Washington News Bureau, but four years later, he parted company with CBS over policy differences. Since 1961, his name, face, and scholarly commentaries have been under the aegis of ABC News, where, in recent years, as every devoted television viewer must already know, he's been the Washington anchorman on the ABC Nightly News. Howard, uh, the competition for audiences in television increases, as you know, and it's driving some news programs to uh, go into, well, almost into entertainment and quite a ways away from what a responsible journalist would regard as legitimate journalism. Is there a danger this may go too far? It goes too far with me, and I think that I, uh, my sensitivities are reasonably representative mm -hmm. of the American people. I like for broadcasters, I like to feel they're talking to me that they know I'm there and they're informing me and not making little in jokes with one another. So I tend to dislike the format you've talked about and I believe the public grows weary of it too. What about the content of the programs themselves? Do you feel any compulsion to provide some elements of entertainment in, in the news format? No, I don't um, feel a, any compulsion to produce entertainment, but I must say the news is so terribly, devastatingly bad that yeah. whenever a light touch can be added, I think it's welcome. <laughs> Harry Reasoner's comments are the other day, instead of a comment, we had a beautiful day in Washington, lots of miserable news about everybody's tax returns. So instead of a comment, I just put on postcard pictures of the beauties <laughs> of Washington. <laughs> I've often wondered, I, you may recall, was it the Soroyan story of the Telegraph editor through whose hands passed so many sad messages that, it, that he ultimately became a terribly weary man. Does a <laughs> newscaster grow weary from the weariness of the news itself? Very much indeed. You are affected by it in some psychic way, are you? Oh, I think quite definitely, yes. Mm. It leaves you depressed at the end of the day when you've told about rising crime figures and some misdeeds by people in whom the nation's placed its trust and things like that and nothing but that. It leaves you depressed and mm. I think my wife ha finds me hard to live with. <laughs> Isn't <laughs> it <laughs> really bad? Should news be measured by a marketplace value? Because you are whether you like it or not, you're in a business. And how well you do against your competitor, for example, it becomes a matter of some importance to the network, if not to mm -hmm. you. I find that our competitors do a high quality job of, of reporting on television and we compete with that high quality job. So I don't think it's really a, a, a terrific issue. Uh, if we are successful in, uh, in telling the news interesting, and, I, and there's no drama as great as real drama. Uh, nothing on television is as good as the drama of real life, and we try to compete in telling that drama. I know that there are excesses. I know that the camera tends to gravitate towards where there's motion rather than where there's meaning, yeah. but uh, nevertheless, I think our competition is to tell the day's news story better than they tell it. So you think then that competition among newscasters will lead to a higher quality? I think it does. Mm. For a long time, uh, my network was the uh, the third network, and we were very bad on news and uh, very poor. But we then entered into serious competition, and now we give them serious competition. And I think distinctly the quality, not just the saleability, the quality of what we tell the public has improved drastically. Many uh, uh, critics of newscasts would say, as you uh, suggested a few moments ago, that television news is pretty well uh, hung with uh, pictures and motion. And you did radio uh, news for a good many years. Do you find the television format at all constricting in the sense that you are stuck with what's available on film or what you can get by satellite? I think, uh, yes, it is constricting, uh, simply because you can't tell much news. Uh, and pictures, I think you have to be a little more, um, 
You can tell less news with pictures. Still, it's more less? vivid news. Uh -huh. Now, uh, we have uh, 30 minutes, allegedly, uh, to tell the news. In fact, if you subtract commercial time, if you subtract our headlines, we're the only network that starts with a minute of headlines. If you subtract our commentary at the end, we have only 20 minutes to tell the day's news. It's far too little. And uh, on radio, telling the news, we could tell more. But uh, with film and giving people time to absorb the picture, uh, we can tell very much less. We really produce every day a 40-minute news program, and our last 20 minutes is given to cutting it back to where it'll fit in That's 30 right. minutes with commercials. So in an ideal world, you'd like more chance to, to talk about the news rather than announcing the news or introducing... Oh, no. no, I think the value of pictures is immense. I think um, telling about the tornadoes recently was not nearly as effective as showing the oh, terrific damage done mm -hmm. by them. And um, telling about the sufferings of... Um, of people is uh, as nothing compared to having those people get on the air and tell where am I, where is my wife, where are my children, they've mm -hmm. disappeared in the tornado. It's much more effective. What is your relationship to the news itself? You're not a reporter who goes out and covers the news, are you? Uh, rarely. When we go away on trips, I am. But uh, in Washington, I'm not, and I'm stationed in Washington. No, I, uh, I'm really the editor of a television newspaper, the Washington Editor. And uh, I write my own commentaries. I write some of the rest of the program, but most of a program, people don't know this, most of the uh, news that I tell is actually leading up to cues to the director to turn on tape or film. Mm. So that I have to be rigidly exact in what I say. So I have someone else write those. You've been a reporter. Do you oh, yes. hanker after uh, go going out after the story yourself at all? Uh, rarely, no. I, I, uh, my day is awfully you, busy. It's packed, mm -hmm. and uh, I really enjoy contemplative journalism more than journalism and more than investigative journalism, trying to find out what the news means. Uh, I, I suppose I'm a student rather than a, a, a good reporter, mm -hmm. and I enjoy being a student of the news. So I do not. Uh, You're known for your. I don't have a fire, uh, fire horse uh, instinct <laughs> to run after the story. I have a. I have a. Uh, I, I guess it's a scholar's instinct to find out what that story means. Mm -hmm. Is it meaningful? Are we telling the real truth about it? You came into news more or less as a scholar, didn't you? Coming out of Louisiana and... Yeah, uh, I, uh, no, I was a reporter for the New Orleans item, now defunct. Then I went to... Uh, no relationship. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I uh, went to Oxford. And when World War II broke out, I left and went to work for United Press, and then the New York Times. I wanted York to carry Times. you further back than that, than the, than the, the, the Oxford days, because mm -hmm. I, I do want you to tell me about that as well. But I gather that you must have been somewhat smitten with journalism fairly early on in well, Louisiana, because you took it up in high school. Yes. As a matter of fact, it was that high school journalism that got you your start, wasn't it? With a, I, yes. I've been told with $100 that finally did get you yes. to your first trip to Europe. Why were you smitten with journalism? Do you, can you recall? I, I like to write. I used to like to write stories when I was a small child. Did you? And I never lost it. I've never really had any other assumption through my life uh, other than being heavyweight champion of the world at the age of five and uh, being president of the United States at the age of six. Seriously? After that, I settled for mm -hmm. writing, and I've always wanted to write. Did you really have ambitions to do these kinds of things, or that's the sort of ambition that every child has at that age, I yes, suppose? Mm -hmm. huh? Yes, I, I failed. <laughs> Certainly not in the writing. Uh, it was in high school, was it not, that you first uh, got... But I, I'd never had any other assumption but that I would do something involved with writing and telling stories. Did you grow up uh, with writing around you, so to speak? No. Not at all? No. Hmm. Well, my father was a brakeman on the railroad, and oh. he was unemployed through most of my life. Mm -hmm. No, I, I just uh, took a liking to it and did it and wrote stories about Peter Rabbit and other consequential pe people when I was very small and continued and never really thought seriously of anything else. Were you a heavy reader? Not frightfully heavy. I liked mm -hmm. to write, but I, I, and I read, but I, was not, uh, I was, did not devour books. Mm -hmm. What was the uh, $100 prize that you won that got um, you off to Europe? The uh, Times-Picayune, which still exists, which is a marvelous name for a newspaper in mm -hmm. New Orleans, uh, gave $100, no, not the Picayune, but it's a columnist, Dorothy Dix, who oh, wrote yes. Advice to the Lovelorn, gave a, a $100 prize for the best human interest story each year. And so I competed and produced one and got the $100 which at that time had hair on its chest. That was a lot <laughs> of money. That's right, yes. Do you recall what the story was? Yes. The, um, 
veterans uh, in the Depression had been fighting to get their bonus now so they could get something to live on. They were in a bad way. And they finally got the bonus. So I went down to the places where veterans hung out and asked them what they were going to do with it and just told the story of what they planned to do with their money. Hmm. And, uh, and got your own as a, uh, as a consequence. <laughs> yes, <laughs> my veterans bonus. What did you do with that money? I spent $10 on a passport and then for the first time in my life I went abroad and Germany was the cheapest country to travel in so I spent three months in Germany traveling. On Hadn't you studied dollars. German before that? I had, uh, it was in the depression I wanted to break into journalism and I wanted to be a foreign correspondent and I just, I uh, calculated there would be a war that Germany would start it mm -hmm. that not many people would want to go to Germany so that would be my opening I'd mm -hmm. learn German no one in my family is German or spoke German, so I sat down and learned German, mm -hmm. and then went to Heidelberg on that ninety dollars, and, and, and studied at, studied at Heidelberg for yes. a, for a brief time. Yes. What was Germany like in those days? Well, it was uh, very efficient. It was uh, anyone who's disgusted with democracy would find it very satisfactory. There was no unemployment, no one misbehaved, the crime rate was low, and everything was fine, except that they were about to exterminate a large part of the human race. Yes. <laughs> it was uh, very distasteful. Mm. Very orderly and very distasteful. You came back then uh, after that, um, what, brief time in Germany to yes. go to work for the newspaper. newspaper. In, in, um, then I applied for a Rhodes Scholarship and got it. Why? Not why did you get it, but why did you apply? I wanted, uh, A, to study some more, and I wanted money. My job on the New Orleans item paid me $15 a week, which mm -hmm. turned out to be $3 less than I could live on. And the Rhodes Scholarship paid me what I considered an enormous sum to go and be a man of leisure at Oxford. Did you have things that you wanted to study particularly? No, I just wanted to be close to where the war was going to break out so that I could Still, still tied to the, the thought that the war was going to break out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What made you so certain of this? You did predict it. Well, just uh, a reading and uh, having little faith in dictatorship that dictatorships can rarely contain themselves without mm -hmm. seeking some external uh, diversion and that in the case of a country as powerful as Germany and as disciplined as Germany meant war. Mm -hmm. So you went to uh, Merton College in Oxford as mm -hmm. a rather militant anti-Nazi, I guess. Very, yes, I was the only American who was the head of the British Labor Party. My predecessor was uh, Dennis Healy, who's now Chancellor of the Exchequer. This is the Labor Party in Oxford. In Oxford, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And Harold Wilson was a teaching fellow. I know about half the present oh. cabinet. Hmm. What were those days like at uh, Oxford? Well, I ceased studying and really became very militant because I was really terribly worried about Hitler and the way that all of us just sat back and assumed we could get along. And I knew we could not. So I organized demonstrations, made speeches, and did everything but study. Hmm. Uh, it was anti-Hitler. Do you believe in demonstrations? Uh, they must have had some slight effect because, um, after all, the British did become convinced they couldn't have a second Munich. And uh, yes, I do. I think uh, expressions of opinion. I don't think they should become violent. I think that alien. I think the uh, civil rights movement lost a lot of its steam when violence became uh, a major method. Mm -hmm. What about your feelings about the British Labour Party since you had joined that at a fairly early age or become very active in it? Have your feelings toward the Labour Party changed over the years or are they still pretty much the same? No, they've changed. I, um, I think it, um, it's become the Conservative Party of Great Britain. It believes in a few Marxist principles which I think are absolutely wrong and out of date. Mm -hmm. I don't think it'll apply them, but they get good cheers from audiences and Labour areas. Now, I think the Labour Party has been a rather disappointment. The nationalizations of industries after World War II, I think, were a failure. They had to be done because the industries were bad, but they're still bad. Mm. Uh, in, in general, I find Britain rather a disappointment. In what ways? Well, I think everybody is asking for more from the economy than there is in it, mm. which means permanent inflation. In their case, that is disastrous because they produce so little of what they need. Half their food they have to buy abroad, and four-fifths of the raw materials their industry uses has to be bought abroad. Mm. So permanent inflation means they can't pay their way. And I foresee a, a terrible future for them unless they can discipline themselves. And neither political party provides leadership. They're rather demagogic in promising things that cannot be had. And discipline themselves means doing without things that they normally would expect. That's right. It means telling them we do not have the standard of living we used to have when we had a vast and rich empire. Mm -hmm. 
we have lost many of the skills that used to bring us great incomes. We've let our productivity fall. We've got to change that. I would judge from, uh, from your commentary, Howard, that you do feel that that applies to not only the British, but to the Americans, perhaps in a lesser degree. Much lesser degree. Do you think that, in a sense, adversity uh, builds our character, strengthens our character, that doing without is sometimes a good thing? I think uh, if the public plenty? has a sense that burdens are being shared fairly, it does us good. Mm -hmm. If the public has a sense burdens are not being shared fairly, it does bad. It causes social frictions, like the truckers refusing uh, paralyzing traffic and um, gas station operators paralyzing traffic by refusing to pump gas. I think we need to create, I think we're going to face a period of doing with less, just simply because we're the pressure of population is creating a demand for which there's not enough supply. And we're going to have to do with less, and we're going to have to live more frugally. Since we lived wastefully, I think we can do it with great success. But the public has to be given a sense of fairness, which it does not have. I think that we, uh, we give too many benefits in our welfare state for the rich, and I don't think we can go on doing that. Mm -hmm. I think that oil depletion allowance has got to go. I think the Highway Trust Fund wasting money papering over the nation with asphalt has got to stop. That money's got to go to some needed purpose. I think tax reform is urgent in this country. And then I think we'll take this well. Americans are very good. Mm. I think we've uh, performed near miracles when we had to. I remember in World War II when Pearl Harbor cut off 95% of our rubber supplies and everyone said, well, we, that's the end of the arsenal for, of democracy. Well, it wasn't. In a year, we had invented and were mass-producing synthetic rubber, and we were the arsenal mm -hmm. of democracy. At the time, nobody thought you could make uh, atomic fission something that could be controlled for any use. We did it in five years. Mm -hmm. We put men on the moon. That's ridiculous. We've done it and brought them back safely. I think we can handle any crisis if the people have a sense the burden's being shared. Mm -hmm. But the answer doesn't lie in the magic of technology, that if we go on the way we are, somehow the the technologists will produce something new, unexpected, that will answer all these problems. I think they can, almost any problem. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. But uh, it means periods of doing without and periods of accepting sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And uh, that ha we have to have a sense of justice to do that. Mm -hmm. You lived abroad for a great many years. As 20. The, 20 as the chief correspondent for CBS News. How did you feel about returning to this country after 20 years abroad? I had been begging for years to come back yeah. here. Europe had really lost its clout. There wasn't any news. I found my broadcasts were increasingly reactions to what happened in Washington yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I begged and begged for years to be brought back, and I was finally brought back. You had two children living abroad, I suppose, didn't you? Yeah, they're both back abroad now. They are? I have a, a boy at Oxford and a girl at the Sorbonne, which probably won't happen again. <laughs> Why did they desire to go abroad? They were reared there, mm -hmm. and they wanted to complete their educations mm -hmm. there. And actually, it's no more expensive than going to an expensive <laughs> college here. <laughs> uh, you left CBS in uh, 1961, and had, having had differences with them with respect to objectivity, that extremely difficult word for mm -hmm. all of us to deal with, I suppose. CBS. I think, uh, no, I, I think the magic word was analysis. They said, you can't comment on our network, you can only analyze. So I offered to produce them 20 years of scripts in which I had analyzed and they hadn't objected, but now suddenly they were calling them comments because they were become, becoming very controversial. The civil rights movement was about to blow up into something serious. Mm -hmm. And uh, I covered an incident in Birmingham where Klansmen without uniforms just beat freedom riders, the first freedom riders ever, just beat them to a pulp. And I reported names, who did it, and everything. And then I analyzed it and said, uh, I analyzed, I commented on it. And uh, the New York Times published a four column uh, piece on that r report of mine saying, This is a, a freedom CBS is not normally given to it. It's correspondence and CBS suspended me then mm -hmm. and later on it led to a break we just disagreed on what should go into the news well there are some as you know who believe that the the uh, the news should be presented in such a manner that each person makes up his own mind the facts are all presented no comment no I believe in that but I believe then you should add comment as we do Why? at ABC mm -hmm. well because um, I, I said a while ago that our news program gives us so little time to uh, tell the news, so we give two dimensions. Now we need a third dimension, and I think comment or analysis can provide it. 
I, in fact, I was brought back from Europe because their regular daily news program was too two-dimensional. They felt some depth had to be given to it, and they asked me to come back and do a commentary every day. So I did for about five years on the evening news at CBS. And uh, that's why I believe there should be a comment to add a, a, a new dimension mm -hmm. to the news that our daily news programs don't give. What about uh, a breadth of comment? That is to say, why should we listen to Howard K. Smith, for example, and what he feels? Well, uh, we, we tried at ABC the Spectrum system. We had 25 commentators on retainers doing commentaries, and we would run two, three, or four a day. Uh, William Buckley was one, um, uh, other conservatives, and Stuart Alsop, and uh, even Malcolm Muggeridge in Great Britain. And uh, we found we were losing audiences. People didn't want that much comment, so we carried out a survey to ask the public which of our commentators were they listening to? Well, it's, um, I'm probably not the one to tell you the results of the survey, but the survey said that they were listening to me. <laughs> so <laughs> ABC said, all right, you do it. Hmm. And uh, then we acquired Harry Reasoner, and he does half of them, and uh, I think it's quite successful. TV seems to be a, a, an almost terrifying medium to some people, and most particularly to politicians. It's a kind of love-hate relationship. On the one hand, they, they have to have it, Mm -hmm. and to get elected to office, but on the other, they seem always to be anxious to curb its power when it doesn't affect them. Why is this? Well, I think they do are frightened by it because it is vivid and apparently it does have some kind of power over public opinion. They seem to spend all fortunes through. getting their uh, commercials on it in election yes. times, and I guess that's the reason. Because you've worked in print, you've worked in radio, and now, of course, you've worked for many years in television. Do you find television is more powerful and its effect upon people? Produces more mail, certainly. If that's a, a simple criteria, a simple judgment of mm -hmm. uh, impact, I get a huge quantity of mail every day, which as a writer I did not get. I used to write a column for newspapers. Mm -hmm. I got mail, but not nearly as much as for television. One of the greatest mail responses you've had was when you were at CBS and did a program on which you uh, allowed Alger Hiss to no, speak. No, this was first uh, ABC. Was ABC, I'm sorry, it was ABC, wasn't it? Uh, and that produced some 60,000 letters. 80,000 80, letters. 80,000, is that right? And you have no idea how many letters 80,000 is. It would fill a large room up to about three quarters. Mm -hmm. And I think it scared everybody to death. But Why? actually the program, well, they thought the world was coming apart. Protests over Alger Hiss appearing on television and uh, attacking Richard Nixon. Actually, the program was very well balanced. Uh, uh, but. Uh, and it was rather a calm program. It was not an anti-Nixon program, which he eventually recognized himself. Mm -hmm. uh, the program was... It was uh, organized. Mm -hmm. This was the uh, peak of the John Birch Society's power, but this mailing campaign was organized. The, uh, the wording of each one was so similar to the others. Mm -hmm. and that's how it came about. What kind of mail do you get now? Well, it's very wide spectrum. Is to say, About sixty percent is favorable, I'd say, and uh, ten percent is rather neutral, and thirty percent. Does it give you any any uh, uh, index to the uh, temper of the country at all with respect to your own? Not commentary? really much. I distrust uh, counting uh, uh, letters pro and con because there are two hundred and ten million Americans, and if I get a thousand letters. I think the world's coming to an end if they criticize me. Well, that's ridiculous because the, the, the rest of the nation yeah. is not reacting that way. I don't think it's a good index as to what people are thinking. No, I don't. I just think it's an index of interest that people are willing to write a thousand letters over a program. <laughs> you uh, were uh, somewhat in the news at the point where uh, Vice President Agnew made his charges against bias in television, and you more or less took his side, saying, yes, indeed, there was bias in network news. Do you still feel that way? Yes. I think, uh, I, I don't think, I don't know whether I said bias, but I said some of his points are well taken. He talked about a liberal establishment. I think the word is r wrongly chosen, an Eastern establishment. I don't think we have an establishment. The British have an establishment. That is a permanent power core elite. We don't. Ours keeps shifting. But still, most of our news is generated from the Northeast. Uh, New York City, all three networks are headquartered. Our only newspaper of record, which if you're going to write a book on current affairs, you have to consult its files, the New York Times. Our tone-setting universities, the prestigious ones, are there. Our book publishers who select what, which books will be published are all in New York. Uh, these people have lunch with one another. They tend, I'm afraid, to think alike, and I find New York a very parochial intellectual atmosphere. And so I thought that he had a point. 
Mm -hmm. I think uh, there is a tendency to be unkind to a politician like Lyndon Johnson who has an uh, e exotic accent from their point of view, mm -hmm. maybe exotic views. What would you do to counter that? I don't to know counter what to the do. centralization of. of uh, I don't know what there is to do but to criticize. It's not terribly serious. I don't think it's as serious as Agnew said. I just think he had a point that was arguable. I, I think he also made a point about negative news. I do think that it's only bad news that makes news, and that's why I try in commentaries occasionally to correct it. I don't know what you do about that either. In fact, people are more interested in bad news. Mm -hmm. If you announce that the crime rate has gone down, they don't pay a lot of attention. But if you mm -hmm. say that rape and murder have gone up, they pay attention. What is news? Uh, I think David Brinkley said news is what I say it is at 6.30 in the evening. Mm -hmm. um, I think it is what a large number of people agree will interest the public most. Our producer mainly, the anchor man, and the editors. So it's a matter of what interests the public rather than what ought to interest the public? It's both, but I, uh, I think the primary uh, thing is what interests the public. We had to choose the other day between leading with Patricia Hearst's alleged conversion to the Symbionese Army and uh, President Nixon's tax returns. Well, the more important of those stories is the president's tax returns, but the more human is Patricia Hearst. So we led with the more human, the more interesting rather than the more important. So people are news. By far. And the best thing on television really is people still saying something they think very strongly about, not action. Thank you very much. <laughs>